What do we know about Jesus? Now that could be a very long topic. Um, I, you know, I think I teach a course of 40 hours on that. So one obviously has to cut down. Uh, I suppose you could say what I'm really going to speak about is can you trust the Gospels and is that a fairly good picture? What kind of picture do you get from reading the Gospels? Well, if you read Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, you learn of a man who is a sage, a teacher, uh, a, a charismatic, a healer and an exorcist, uh, someone who travelled uh, peripatetically from village to village, town to town and so on, who got into conflicts with uh, people who didn't like his form of talking about God, um, had very enthusiastic followers, was really someone who started a major movement and uh, towards the end of his public ministry encountered the authorities. The context overall is a nation living under a fairly ruthless colonial power, Rome. Um, notwithstanding the sketch in Monty Python, they weren't just there for people's uh, better public works. Um, they were effectively creating what's typical of the time, a very large agrarian empire which extracts a fairly large amount of production from local people through taxes, uh, tolls, and is certainly resented by the Jewish people at the time. The Jews have had a period of about 80 years independence, not long before, before the Romans arrived. And in Jesus' day are looking for a great royal king to deliver them from foreign power. A royal messiah, well at the time there were various theories of what kind of messiahs might come. Some groups even expected two, a priestly messiah and a royal messiah. Um, but the general expectation was for a royal messiah in the line of King David the King, of Israel's golden age a thousand years before. This is a very old nation we're dealing with. Their memories go back uh, then further than our memories on these islands in terms of recorded history now. Um, you know, Abraham is, is getting on for 2,000 years before Jesus. So they have this ancient memory, they hope for deliverance again, and that role is not something Jesus wants to fit in with, at least according to our Gospels. Uh, he has uh, some in an encounter with the authorities at the end in Jerusalem. He is crucified, which is probably the, pun the, the punishment for a rebel or a hardened criminal. He, he dies, and according to the Gospels, he's resurrected and ascends to be heavenly Lord. That's the story of the Gospels. Um, can you trust it? I would say in large measure, yes, and I'll give you a case for that. Um, but the case will be hard or easy, very much according to worldview. If your worldview is one in which miracles don't happen, uh, then the Gospels will be quite difficult to absorb and accept as they are. If your worldview is one in which those strange kind of things can happen, then you'll feel more easy with those kind of narratives. Now, the case I would argue about the Gospels myself is not that you can trust them from beginning to end in every microcosm of detail, uh, every minutiae, all the minutiae. Um, the, f the feel I have about the Gospels from having studied them for a fairly long time and seen what scholars do with them is that they're written about a generation a little bit more after Jesus' time. And they're written perhaps when the camera is starting to go slightly out of focus. You can find differences amongst the Gospels. Sometimes the differences are more easy to handle than on other occasions. And it makes sense to see the Gospels that way because they're being created at a time when the last eyewitnesses to Jesus are dying off. So as the first generation who had the stronger memory are passing away, we start to get written sources which have been preserved. So the writing of the Gospels, roughly 65 AD, if I'm allowed, am I allowed to say AD? I mean, even, am I supposed to say CE sometimes? AD, 65 AD to maybe as late as 90 or 100, that kind of period when the Gospels are written. The second generation after Jesus as the first generation um, are largely passing away. It makes sense for the Gospels to be written at that time. 
What kind of problems do you get looking at the Gospels as a scholar? Well, this is, this is an interesting one. You do get differences. I heard a wonderful story a while ago, which I shall relate. Um, a man came home to his house and his wife was all excited and said, you wouldn't believe what's just happened. An hour ago, uh, a man came to the doorstep. Uh, you know, I opened wondering what, what was happening, you know. And he immediately told me, you, you've won the lottery. Uh, you've won a million pounds, and it's actually a million dollars. And uh, they started to interview me and doing all sorts of things, you see. Now, a little while later, an hour later, things have sort of settled down a bit in the home and a, an interview crew come in and uh, what's been happening? Well, she says, I've uh, two men were at my doorstep two hours ago. Uh, one of them had a camera and the other one uh, had some documents in his hand and saying, I just, you've just won the lottery. Ah, well, the story's been told in two ways. Was there one man on the doorstep or two? Uh, this is relevant, for example, to the resurrection narratives in the Gospels, where if you read John, beginning of chapter 20, there's one woman who goes to the tomb, one witness to the resurrected Jesus, initially Mary Magdalene. If you read the other Gospels, there's a group of women. So is it fair to say, well, historical testimony, eyewitness testimony is sometimes selective, it sometimes shows a perspective, it's going to naturally therefore throw up some contradictions, but nonetheless can be essentially trusted as long as big bits of evidence somewhere else don't count against it. And I would say yes, that's, that's one of the things that happens in the Gospels. There are elements of variation um, to do with selection, uh, to do with the perspective of the particular speaker or writer on the particular occasion. Hmm, is it always that easy? Not really. Um, beginning of this handout, for example, there's some notes on the date of Jesus' birth. You'd think if Jesus is an important person, remembered as the saviour of thousands, hundreds of thousands in the ancient world, millions, then we'd know when he was born. Ah, a bit tricky. Um, if you read Luke, so far as we can tell, the census under Quirinius, the legate of Syria, probably didn't happen till 6 AD. But on the other hand, there's even an, even an indication in Luke's narrative, and certainly in Matthew's narrative, that Jesus is born under Herod the Great, who died in 4 BC, if I'm allowed to say BC. Um, tricky that, a bit awkward, and people have their theories. Well, maybe Quirinius had been legate of Syria uh, in an earlier term. Uh, that hasn't come down to us in our, our historical records. And of course, that's a possibility, but many scholars will want to produce slightly at that moment and say, well, don't be naive. I mean, are you sure our history is that good? Um, and of course, we only have birth narratives in Matthew and Luke, not in Mark. And it looks as if Mark is the early gospel of those three. So maybe I shouldn't be trusting the birth narratives as solidly as I'm trusting the rest of the gospels. So these are the kind of issues that come up. Um, you have to sort of live with them if you teach about the Gospels in a university, and I find it's good with students not to cover the problems. There could be an explanation for something sometimes. On other occasions, it seems more difficult. And uh, the line I find myself often saying is, isn't it wonderful that God has given four, us four Gospels and we can work out what happened? And I can live with that some people find that more difficult. Um, a barrister friend observed to me quite recently, isn't it interesting, language about the infallibility of the Bible came up in the late 19th century, round about the same time as people in Rome were talking about the infallibility of the Pope when he spoke ex cathedra. I'm not speaking against either group here, but it could be that language about the infallibility of scripture has a lot to do with context disputes of former times and sometimes we receive fossils 
of uh, knowledge which we may or may not want to integrate into our theology. Maybe infallibility language about the Bible is a little unwise and is it really necessary anyway? As a good Anglican, you probably know, if you're a good Anglican, that the only thing you have to believe, according to the 39 articles, is that the scriptures contain all things pertaining to salvation. The point of the emphasis on the Bible, especially in Protestantism, is not that everything is true in matters of cosmology, implied genetics and everything else from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, but it contains what we need and we do not need more than that. So I'm kind of happy with these, with these moves in discussion. God gave us four Gospels, we can work out what happened about Jesus and I don't need to, I would say, overstress matters of detail about the Bible. That is already very difficult for some Christian believers and I understand that. Where I am is not to do with my uh, most natural heart convictions actually, it's to do with where my study pushes me. Um, to go on, what is this outline about? Well, there's a long outline there. Um, goes through some data which you may find useful. Um, it's not the case that detailed study of the Gospels always throws up a negative. Uh, Jeremy Bowen, a few years ago, turned up on a late night Sunday program in Bethlehem. Did anyone see Jeremy Bowen, the journalist in a cave near Bethlehem? Um, explaining that it really helped you understand something about the birth narratives in that there had been no room for the Holy Family at the inn, says the King James Version, but the word in Greek is kataluma, which just means the upper part of a house. And in the Bethlehem area, and even today, archaeologically you can show that there are typical houses built over caves in the rock formations under where the houses had been built the cave being used for the animals and the heat rising helping the house in winter, the upper part of the house where the human folk usually lived. And so, you know, suddenly someone walking through the old rock formations near Bethlehem can see something about a narrative in the, in, in the Gospel and they can understand something about it. So our historical evidence and our detailed critical study doesn't always go one way. Sometimes it's very helpful in the other direction. Um, a big question that is very common now is, well, what about all the other Gospels? Have you heard anyone talking about other Gospels? Weren't there loads of them? Wasn't the church just very prejudiced in the ones it received and the ones it ejected? Um, what about all those exciting books I can find on the internet, variously called the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary? and more besides. Um, the general approach to take to those, and this is sound, in my view, <laughs> I'm allowed, it's, it's, it's a danger. You know, that especially in Germany, professors do such a long training and they get to their mid-40s and finally get their job and they feel they can speak like Moses from the mountain. This is the truth, you know. And, but, but on the basis of a degree of humble opinion about this, I think this is a fair opinion. The fair opinion is that the um, writers of the early church, the thinkers of the early church, did well when they, roughly speaking, selected the earliest Gospels as the, one, the ones the church should read profitably in church, in public, and was more suspicious of the later written Gospels, the Gospels that come from the second century and beyond, which often, in fact, usually have to do with a movement called Gnosticism, which was a little bit different, um, had a few of its own ideas, a few of its own problems. Um, and uh, the early writers of the church rejected those Gospels using rough general criteria, which, which they expressly called um, you know, universal acceptance. Do all the churches everywhere have these Gospels and believe they're true? And they discovered, no, they tended to be a little bit local. That actually suggests their later writings, which haven't spread out as Christianity itself has spread out. Another prominent idea is do they go back to an apostle or the testimony of an apostle, i.e. one of the first generation? And with those criteria and a few others, the Gnostic Gospels essentially started to get pushed to the edge as not general teaching. Uh, that doesn't seem to quite uh, 
get into the consciousness of people who write, slight, uh, write scripts for slightly sensationalist programs at about seven or eight on a Sunday. And I won't say which television channel tends to broadcast these, there's more than one. Um, who are always throwing new information at, new information. Oh, if you but knew it, Jesus was married. Oh, on the basis of what do you believe that? Well, it's this line at the end of this book that turned up in this cover, which is probably a late book anyway, and the sentence isn't complete, but possibly it's Jesus kissing a woman on the mouth, and, 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 and. And of course, that somehow appeals to those who go for an assumed position, which is the church has been lying to us and haven't been telling us the truth. And if we only but knew, it's all quite different from what the church has traditionally taught. Um, no, that's, those are not good positions. One of the things one notices teaching in universities is the standard of scholarship behind broadcasting goes down. And it really does. It is shocking the way not especially good information based on semi-hearsay hearsay and willful almost twisting of a piece of historical information in another direction somehow becomes the latest expose, the latest real fundamental historically founded critique of traditional Christianity. I, I'm trying not to sound too cynical, but the, the standard of theological education is going down in that respect. Um, if you work in university, you'll know the exciting things to study are theology and literature, theology and media, the theology of popular culture, the theology of rap music, all of which courses attract many students um, because it's that, I'm being too cynical, because it's more difficult than learning a bit of Greek, learning a bit of Hebrew, knowing a bit of Latin and doing some real historical study, you know. And it's easy to give people better marks there. I mean, if you just comment in a general way on the theology of a rap song, well, who can stop giving 60% and a 2-1 to a student? Whereas with, you know, with a bit of Latin or a bit of Greek that actually has to be accurately translated, well, it's easier to get the person down in the fail, the fail bracket if they're not doing very well, when you're not allowed to do that because we're all being targeted to get everybody through a degree at some magnificent level to prove that we're a quality institution. Am I, am I, I, you, know, you know, in the early modern period, there, were, there was a Christian sect called the Ranters. If, if, if you feel I'm ranting, just say he's ranting, you know, go away. Um, no, but the standard of historical scholarship has gone down and it's noticeable in broadcasting. Um, where do we go from here? Well, some, some general arguments about what we know about Jesus. On the first page of the handout, we have a source from a Roman historian, Tacitus or Tacitus, some people like saying. There's a source from Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, who is an early writer, Josephus, you've perhaps heard of him. Um, these sources show you're not simply dependent on the Gospels for a conviction that, you know, Jesus was a historical figure and lived. There are sources from people who are not uh, members of the Christian Church, who are probably antagonistic to the Christian churches of the time, who give you some bits of information. It may not be very much, but that's not surprising the adherents of a group tend to write more about its founder than the people opposed to it. It's not surprising that the books about Jesus got written by Christian believers. Um, if you're interested in the content here, the first one is uh, Nero, wonderfully played in a film by Peter Ustinov. Do you remember that? Um, seems to have blamed the fire of Rome in 64 AD on the Christians. Uh, the name Christus comes up in that source. Clear evidence that people in Rome knew there were Christians, knew there had been a man the Christians referred to as Christ and so on. Uh, the second one, a dispute, strangely about a man called Crestus, in a historian called Suetonius. Hmm. Well, in Greek, Christus and Christus don't sound so different the confusion is thought by scholars to be understandable. We know in the New Testament, uh, in Acts 18, we learn something of people who've lately arrived from Rome having been expelled, lately arrived in Corinth having been expelled from Rome. So the sources in the New Testament, the source in the New Testament, uh, 
and the Roman historian Suetonius seem to fit together there quite nicely. The third one is about persecution of early Christians and wonderful story about what they were doing. They would take an oath in the morning of what's probably the Lord's Day, the Sunday, and uh, would agree not to commit any theft, robbery, adultery, nor betray any trust, nor refuse to restore a deposit on demand. This done, they would disperse. Why do you think they're dispersing on a Sunday? Because they had to go and work. <laughs> it's, it's only the kind of Jewish tradition and later the Christian tradition which uh, doesn't have people working every day of the week. Well, that was an innovation that, that came from the Jewish race and spread from there. Uh, but most people worked all the time every day of the week in antiquity, unless they were very rich. Um, well, there's a source. They would disperse, then they would meet later to eat food together. We know eating food together was very important for early Christians. It was part of Jesus' social message. Meeting together around one table, rich and poor together. Read 1 Corinthians 11 when it seemed to go wrong a bit. And Paul says, well, if the rich are eating and the poor aren't eating, this is not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. It's a fairly powerful social message there linked to the fundamental Christian regular ceremony, the Eucharist, the, eat the eating together. Um, Josephus, four at the bottom, uh, gives us first of all a reference there to Jesus in the context of the killing of James the brother of Jesus in the 50s. Over the page is the more famous source from Josephus. I should have said who Josephus is. Josephus, Jewish historian, wrote in Greek from the 80s into the 90s of the first century. Um, was a clever chap and switched to the right side in the Jewish revolt, 66 to 70, was later, um, later received the patronage of the Emperor Vespasian, is writing as a Jew, uh, defending Jews in the way he can and not wanting to say anything unpleasant to a Roman Emperor. This is a much more disputed source and you can tell how historians are going to handle this if you read it. Um, about the time Jesus arose, a wise man, what about the next phrase? If it is indeed lawful to call him a man. Do you think a, a, a Jewish opponent of Christianity would have written that? Or do you think possibly a Christian scribe has got involved and has slightly rewritten that as the books have been passed down? Well, most scholars are skeptical about that line. He was a doer of wonderful deeds and teacher of those who gladly received the truth. That seems to be an affirmation that Jesus taught the truth, which you might not expect Josephus to say, so that's suspicious. He drew to himself many, both of the Jews and of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. I don't expect Josephus the Pharisee believed that. So an, another problem. Uh, and you can go on. Uh, the source looks as if it's been slightly manipulated. It's a probably a fair reading, given the circumstances. But don't worry about that. That kind of thing happens. And as sometimes I, I tell students very naughtily, you don't know anyone in church who's ever told a porky pie, do you? Um, sometimes that kind of thing happens, folks, even with Christian sources, possibly. Um, but let's say Josephus gives us a testimony to the existence of Jesus, though one of the passages may have been manipulated. Um, great. Now, historians who are trying to work on Jesus, well, they've always had the Gospels. I mean, they're usually very often Christian believers. They've heard the Gospels as a child in church, in school, in religious education. They get to university, they want to do something more exciting. So let's read other sources about Jesus, they think. Let's study the Jewish Talmud and what that says about Jesus. And there are some references to Jesus in the Jewish Talmud. The Jewish Talmud really based on sources which begin about 200 AD in written form and the latter parts of the Babylonian Talmud, there are two, Palestinian and Babylonian, are up to about 600 AD. Um, this is a source. It comes from the Babylonian Talmud 43a. It is taught, on Passover Eve, they hanged Yeshu, 
Well, Yeshu is the name Jesus in Hebrew. It's a shortening of the name Yehoshua, which is the name Joshua. They hanged Yeshu. For 40 days beforehand, a crier went out proclaiming he is going out to be stoned because he practiced magic and let Israel astray. If anyone has anything to say in his defense, let him come and speak for him. But they found nothing in his favor, so they hanged him on Passover Eve. Not really how the story of Jesus' death happens in the Gospels, is it? It seems to be a rather hasty affair. Possibly there's some compression in the Gospel story. There are some arguments which would suggest Jesus' arrest may have been as early as the Tuesday or the Wednesday night. But that being said, Jesus seems to have been dispatched fairly hastily. But the idea that someone went around Jerusalem publicly appealing for any positive testimony about Jesus for 40 days before the end, well, that's inconsistent with the gospel picture. And again, a historian would say, interesting as a source, but it seems to be part of the dispute between Christians and Jews. Jews accusing, uh, Jews being accused of illegitimately having dispatched Jesus uh, by Christians and giving accounts of matters which look to me to have porky pies in them, really. Um, am I being anti-Semitic saying that? See, everything's about political correctness, is it? And I'm not. I just feel a historian should be realistic. This source is testimony, at least, that Jews and Christians were disputing about Jesus in later centuries. It's not valuable for its more narrow detail. Um, that being said, I don't think there's much you're going to get out of the Jewish Talmud that's reliable about Jesus himself. It, that the Jewish Talmud does have interesting things to tell us about the way Christians and Jews were disputing in that era and even things Christians were doing. Uh, there's a man called Jacob the Min, would you believe, who went around healing people in Galilee in Jesus' name. He's in the Talmud. There's a book by a man called Hartford, Christianity in Talmud and Midrash. Well, there we are, you know, I mean kind of consistent with early Christianity, isn't, isn't it? You know, Jesus did send out disciples to heal people, and the Talmud tells us about a Jesus disciple who went around healing people. I wouldn't say it's a bad source, unless my worldview says, well, that kind of thing can't happen anyway. But that's a worldview question. Um, now here we're back to those strange journalistic efforts on Sunday nights with the next sources. The New Testament Apocrypha, often the later Gospels and similar materials, other versions of Acts of the Apostles and so on, are summarized under the heading New Testament Apocrypha, New Testament hidden books. Well, the churches at the time thought they ought to be hidden. They didn't say they might not be profitable at all, you could read them privately, but they weren't for public reading. So they're called hidden books, Apocrypha. The tendency, again, and this has to do with some large changes in religious thinking and cultural movements. The tendency in some circles is to prefer the Gnostic Gospels over the canonical Gospels, as I've said. Um, probably because the Gnostic Gospels are more palatable to New Age thinking. The kind of pantheism uh, that you find in New Age theory can be fairly easily reconciled with some things in the Gnostic Gospels. Um, Shirley MacLaine, have you come across her? Came across a book by her the other day, a great enthusiast and went somewhere to, in, to South America and had an out-of-body experience and exited from the world through the planets with her soul attached to her body by a silver thread. Well, that stuff is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, if you weren't a Christian believer or had an attachment to Christian things, you might think, oh, I'm going to read Shirley MacLaine's Out on a Limb, and I'm going to find out about spiritual things. And certainly the Gnostic Gospels have, have content which is palatable to those people. There's also a tendency to say, oh, and they give the other side of Christianity, they give the feminist perspective, the woman perspective, they're positive about women. The church, run by those terrible patriarchal early bishops, was just cramming everybody down and shoving everything into their mould, and we can get the other side of the story by reading the Gnostic Gospels. Um, well, here's a Gnostic Gospel passage, Gospel of Thomas. Simon Peter said, Let Mary go forth from among us, for women are not worthy of the life. 
Well, all right, the disciples do say bad things sometimes in the Gospels, so what does Jesus do about this? I'm sure he sorts out the problem, doesn't he? Jesus said, Behold, I shall lead her that I may make her male, in order that she also may become a living spirit like you males. For every woman who makes herself male shall enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> what on earth have we got here? Has anyone seen the film about C.S. Lewis, Shadowlands? Yeah? Do you remember the common room conversation in which he introduces uh, the woman who becomes his wife in an Oxford common room and a rather waspish, sexist, donish figure explains that Aristotle told us that women do not have rationality, women do not have souls. Uh, and why on earth would we want a woman in a common room of a university because they can't think, is his basic perspective. Please forgive me for any offence I cause. I'm only rehearsing the scene as best I remember it. But this is Aristotelian philosophy. That, you know, men have rationality and women, well, that's a bit different. Um, and it's, would you say, it's infected the story of Jesus. It's been brought in. There's a very educated person here. He knows his Aristotle. He's trying to push his Aristotelian ideas into a gospel which isn't even going to get a hearing unless he promulgates it under the name of one of the early apostles. So he says it's Thomas's gospel, but it doesn't sound like an authentic witness of Thomas about Jesus to me. It's not really consistent with the positive picture of Jesus' attitude to women in the gospels we have. So I'm going to say no, throw that one in the bin or study it for its own value as a source about Gnosticism whenever this was written. Um, but don't make the assumption that the church has, in some scurrilous fashion, kept from your view hugely valuable early materials about Jesus, because they didn't, and they haven't. Um, am I seeming prejudiced here? I sort of am, I think, you know. Um, here's another one. Um, the Gospel of Peter. Oh, well, I want to read this. It's a gospel that seems to be linked to Peter. But I think, again, it's probably a gospel being put out in Peter's name to try and get a hearing. And I suspect this is not Peter. It's about the moment of Jesus' death. Uh, well, the account is that Jesus is silent at the crucifixion uh, because he feels no pain. That's probably because he does not really have a material body. He only appears to have a material body. Well, this is Greek philosophy and the way it's affecting the story of Jesus. Plato, have you come across Plato in his cave ever? Plato was into the ideal world, the spiritual world, the intellectual world. He thought that that was where permanence was. Supernatural realities, the ideas lived forever. The material world uh, only gives copies and shadows of those ultimate realities and cannot sort of house anything permanent or lasting. Certainly can't house in a permanent way divinity, God. God really belongs in the upper realm, not the lower realm of the material. So what we have here is Platonic philosophy in a fairly obvious way being imported into the story of the Gospels. Um, with the theory that Jesus said nothing, cried out in no way on the cross because, well, he didn't feel pain. Furthermore, when he does cry out, he cries, my power, my power, why have you forsaken me? Well, you know and I know that Jesus rehearsed the first line of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, in Aramaic. As you know, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that one. Um, possibly Jesus was meditating on Psalm 22 on the cross because it's a psalm of terrible rejection in which someone's hands and feet are even pierced. But finally God will uh, liberate them. Finally God will rescue them. Um, it seems to have changed. Well, we know from writings contemporary with this, this is the theory that Jesus was really a kind of two-stage being. There was a man... But in this kind of worldview, a human being couldn't really house divinity in any permanent way. 
and onto the man Jesus descended, the Holy Spirit, or this theory calls it Christ. The Christ Spirit therefore tags along with the man Jesus for a while and does all the wonderful works that Jesus does. And then before the cross departs, leaving the man Jesus bereft of the Christ Spirit, sorry this is confusing, uh, uh, to die meaninglessly on the cross because actually all salvation, anything positive, only belongs to God and comes from the upper realm and can't ever have anything to do with this material realm. Well, John's Gospel said the word became flesh, something a Gnostic, a Gnostic could never say, something which would be very, very hard to synthesize into a, sim a simply platonic philosophy. So again, the way the, the Gnostic Gospels play with things, play with the tradition, change the tradition, shows what influences and what debates are affecting the Christian story in the second century and beyond, you can tell fairly clearly why the bishops of the early churches rejected those stories. And they're interesting for their own sake, and they tell us something about how debate works and how literary sources work, but we needn't depend on them as a source about Jesus. That's my general view. Now, if someone were to come to me for a, with a really good case that this one or two saying passage in the Gospel of Thomas, you know, really is very, very like the historical Jesus, and, well, possibly this is authentic, wouldn't you think? And, you know, I'm not going to concede it couldn't be. But the general perspective is the more you see cases based on Gnostic texts from the second century and beyond, the more sceptical you should be, especially when people play the conspiracy theory on you and say the church has been awful to you and, and this stuff is the real stuff and they've kept it out of your eyes. Rubbish. That's just rubbish. Am I allowed to say rubbish? Yeah. I think I'm close enough to my pension to be able to say rubbish. <laughs> um, uh, but I would have said it anyway, actually. Um, that leads you really to a conclusion as a historian. You can't get very far with your picture about Jesus unless you base it on the, the canonical Gospels, the Gospels in the New Testament. That's just the reality, folks. Going on. But the study of the Gospels is complex. Let's think of an example, Matthew 5, 38, following Luke 6, 29. You know Jesus is presented in the, gospel, in the Gospels as a teacher of non-violence, yes? Jesus says, turn the other cheek. In Luke's Gospel, he says, if someone takes your cloak, your heavy outer garment, take off your lighter inner tunic as well and give it to him. Well, it's funny stuff. It's humorous, it's hyperbole. If someone rips your cloak from your back, pull off your tunic, give it to him and walk away naked. I don't think it was really advice to be taken exactly literally, but you get the drift. You get the drift. Simply don't react to the person who treats you badly. Love everybody, forgive everybody, and don't take offense. Right? Feels like Jesus, okay. When I get to Matthew, it comes out a bit differently. First of all, the garment words are reversed. And then you get talk about suing in law, not taking. And Matthew says, if anyone would sue you for your tunic, or sometimes shirt in older translations, your lightweight inner garment, let him also have your cloak. So which did Jesus say? Ah, well here's a scholarly solution which is probably reliable, but you know, study of history is, it's about probabilities. See if you think it's probable. Um, a scholar might say, ah, I know the law of Moses. The law of Moses is very interested in protecting the poor person. And at one point says, you shall not take a poor man's cloak as a pledge wherein shall he sleep? Well, the heavy outer garment would also be the blanket of the poor person. The poor person might be hungry. They might go to their neighbor wanting to borrow money so they and their family can eat. You are not to take, says the law, the man's garment before you give him any money, saying, well, if you don't pay me back, you don't get your cloak back. That's deemed immoral. The law protects the cloak of the poor person. So perhaps 
whoever came up with the version we get in Matthew, possibly the evangelist himself or the, the way he's reproducing sayings, has been a little bit worried that he thinks, taken literally, something Jesus said contradicts the law of Moses. The law of Moses protects the cloak, and here's Jesus saying, let someone have your cloak. In a moment of panic, possibly before writing his sermon or something, he decided to change the words. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm jesting. But the Matthew version looks like an attempt to defend Jesus from every possible charge of contradicting the law of Moses, probably in a context where there was hefty debate between the Jews of the synagogues and the Christians of the separating churches. I can live with that. And I say, you know, I've got to be reasonable in a university. I've got to say, if it seems to be a good case to you, accept it and work out what your theology is going to be accommodating that. And my theology is God gave us four Gospels. We can work out what Jesus said and didn't talk. Fine. There's going to be these awkward bits in the way the garment is sewn together, but I can live with that. And, you know, these are human vessels and they transmit things with, with some of the flaws they introduce to the material. I don't think it's reasonable to push the case much harder than that. And in a sense, one hurts Christian apologetic if one does. Go as far as the case can reasonably be argued. And you can make a decent defense of the Jesus in the Gospels. Push it too far and people will disbelieve you and you'll actually harm the proclamation of the Christian message. That, that's the position I would take. Um, so there's an example there. Uh, you have similar problems with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Or is it blessed are the poor, as in Luke? Is, is it the humble who are blessed? Or is it the economically poor? The scholars generally these days go for the Luke version, blessed are the poor. I expect you could come up with a case that somehow Jesus might have said both, or both are entirely consistent with Jesus' teaching. And perhaps the way Matthew presents this is that Jesus' teaching on humility, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, has been imported into this blessing saying, this beatitude, perhaps wrongly. It's not a huge problem. And maybe you can argue that Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit as well as blessed are the poor. But this is what I'm saying about the, the gospels are written in the late first century, probably when the picture is starting to go out of focus a little. But with careful study across the whole range of material, you can get a good picture of what went on. Um, that's, that's a fair position. I, you know, I taught in Oxford in the 80s and there was still a lecturer who would profess very boldly, we know almost nothing about Jesus. Or if you talk to people who've trained in theology in the 60s and 70s, more generally in Britain, they'll often be uh, captive to that sort of view because that was what learned professors served to them. That's not right. That, that's an unreasonable view. Um, Let's not worry about those extreme views. And I'll tell you why. Um, as I say at the bottom there, there is a problem of miracles. Um, what happened when Jesus walked on the water? Well, maybe Jesus walked on the water, but there were those in the 19th century who didn't believe that kind of thing happened and suggested, well, perhaps he was on a piece of driftwood or a sandbar. Um, you may have heard them yourself. Is the miracle of the feeding, the 5,000 say, really about multiplication of food miraculously, or is it the greater miracle that happens in our hearts when we are persuaded to share? And the little boy got out his lunch and was prepared to share, the, share his loaves and fishes, and then everyone else thought, that's the better way. And they shared what they had in their belts and pockets, etc. too. And suddenly there was enough food for everybody. And this was a great miracle. What we call rationalizing explorations of the miracles, explanations of the miracles. Well, if you like, uh, you know, it, the transfiguration. Well, the sun came up on the mountain. These were primitive people. They kind of imagined it was the glory of God about Jesus. And maybe a couple of trees were interpreted as the figures of Elijah and Moses with Jesus in Mark 9. 
Well, there are problems from this, with this from two angles. First of all, the explanations aren't always plausible. Uh, and by the way, were they really primitive people always making mistakes in the way they saw things around Jesus? I doubt it. Um, one, if you get to know the ancient world, you know how critical and analytical people can be. Uh, science, in one sense, did not begin with the modern world. Um, but going on from that, if you even accept that kind of explanation for some of Jesus' miracles, what have you achieved? Jesus did something unusual, or did he? And what on earth is the significance of this story, given that it was always a mistaken interpretation of what had ha actually happened? Um, so the rationalizing explanations of the miracles I would tend to reject as not a useful path in theology, as I think most people would today though it's surprising how often they still creep into sermons. Um, alternative explanations have attempted to use the character of myth, the category of myth. That is, they are poetic or imaginative narratives which are telling you a theological truth, although the event didn't happen. So Jesus on the mountain, especially Matthew, uh, radiates the glory of God just as Moses had uh, when he exited the tabernacle having spoken with God. And so this tells us Jesus is a lawgiver and a redeemer figure far more significant than Moses and all the accoutrements of the Moses sto story are there anyway. Moses had plenty of glory, so did Jesus. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure that uh, quality to the story is there, especially in Matthew. Jesus is definitely presented as a better Moses figure, if you like, in Matthew, or the true interpreter of the law, or the better lawgiver, however you want to define the categories. Um, but you have rather lost the miracle, and is it right to do that? And I, th I really think that comes down to worldview. That's really whether you accept such things can happen. If you accept such things can happen, then maybe you can accept many of the stories, but then possibly not all, or possibly all of them seem reasonable, whereas some of the, re some of the uh, miracles in the rejected Gospels from the second century, the boy Jesus making birds out of clay, breathing life into them and them flying away, Perhaps you want to say, well, those don't seem so plausible to me, but the ones in the Gospels, which seem to be about making people's lives better, um, that I can accept. You know. But if, if your worldview is such things don't happen, then obviously this isn't going to work for you. Um, but going on, I mention what's called form criticism and scepticism. I hasten through this because I know my time is going. There was a scholar called Rudolf Bultmann, in Germany from the 20s to the 60s of the last century, 70s really, 70s of the last century, who made a quite trenchant attack on the content of the Gospels, which is where the very sceptical strands in theological training come from. He proposed, for example, that Christian prophets spoke in the name of the Lord, and things that had been declared and had been found helpful as sayings of the Lord by the prophets in the early church then found their way into the story of Jesus, as if he had said these things. Then he proposed that such sayings might acquire, in the process of oral telling, a setting around the story, a, a typical scene in which Jesus might have been in conflict with Pharisees, or a typical scene of healing, they always have the same shape and so on. And suddenly the story of Jesus in the Gospels is evaporating because the closing saying comes from an early Christian prophet, not Jesus, during his earthly ministry. And the setting of the story is just an ideal scene, the kind of things storytellers tended to construct around them. Um, were one to go down that route in the understanding of what happens in the oral phase of early Christianity, you would lose your Jesus. He would be gone behind a great mass of creativity in the first generation phase before the Gospels get written down. Um, there are many things I'd like to tell you about why Bultmann is wrong. Um, but just uh, there, there's a paragraph, some responses to early, uh, uh, some early responses to this kind of skepticism. Note that issues of real importance in the early church are not reflected in the tradition about Jesus in the Gospels. If you read 
Galatians and elsewhere in Paul's letters, you know whether Christians ought to get circumcised and keep the law like Jews was a huge big question. Circumcision is never mentioned in the Gospels except possibly in John 7 once. So it doesn't look as if the Gospel tradition is really addressing the issues of the day directly. It's reflective of the past. It's things that have happened in the past, not so directly turned to current events. That doesn't mean that sometimes when you look at a gospel narrative, say that saying about non-violence and letting someone have your coat or is it your shirt, you're in a garment, that doesn't mean that you can't sometimes see that quality of accommodation of the material to the age in which it's been passed through. Um, but by and large, there are big issues in the early church which are not addressed directly by Jesus in the gospels. Um, here's another one. Titles of Jesus are used conservatively. It's clear that Jesus spoke of himself often in a rather enigmatic way as the Son of Man, a title used massively in the Gospels, though scholars debate exactly what it means. Nonetheless, if you look at the letters of the New Testament, Son of Man, or other writings, Son of Man as a title is hardly ever used. What does this tell us? It tells us that the tra tradition is older than the letters. The early church spoke in terms of Jesus as Son of God and things like that. The Gospels had Jesus speak of himself, himself in terms of Son of Man, a title the early church didn't really pick up that much. So you get a feel for the material. It's old, it's passed on faithfully, it's not really being twisted and turned to the needs of the moment at every point. Uh, people often say unflattering details about Jesus are still evident. For example, the story of Jesus uh, being called mad by his family in Mark 3. They say he's He's gone a bit wrong and we want to take him away. And you might say, well, that's a rather unflattering detail to be preserved, but it seems to have been part of the story that was preserved. No, well, no one really felt it reflected Jesus in a bad light in any way, although obviously he had some family problems. Um, this being said, what are you going to do with this common objection, which is that the material in the Gospels has in, been passed on by word of mouth for about a generation, sometime from the 30s into the 60s and beyond. Maybe it's been changed a lot. Can we really get to Jesus once they start writing this oral material down? Um, the arguments go like this. The Scandinavian school, two Scandinavian scholars Harald Riesenfeld and Birger Gerhardsen, I understand you're supposed to say, um, emphasized that oral tradition was passed on with considerable care amongst Jewish teachers, and this reflected, uh, is reflected in the way Paul speaks about the Lord's teaching in 1 Corinthians. For example, the references we have below in the next paragraph, to the married I give charge, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband. Sounds very like the teaching of Jesus against polygamy, against divorce that you find in the Gospels. And Paul says that's not having a charge from the Lord. On another matter he has to deal with, he says, to the rest I say, not the Lord. Well, he's saying, I'm saying this, not Jesus. You've got Jesus teaching, I can give you that. But this bit isn't covered in that, so I'm going to say. Um, uh, now concerning the unmarried, 1 Corinthians 7.25, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. What's he saying? I know what Jesus taught, and he didn't give us a word on this one. So I haven't got a command of the Lord, but I'm giving my, my opinion, and I would say, trust me on this. It's always dangerous when people say that. At least we think like that today, don't we? Um, but you know, this is what I think, and this is what I think you should adhere to. But I can't base this on the Jesus tradition. I can't ba base this on a word of Jesus that I learned and heard of. So Jesus' own words are distinguished from Paul's own teaching, and it looks as if Paul is very willing to refer to them. Going on, um, the well-known words of the Eucharistic service, 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, is the language of Jewish oral tradition. This has been proven at chapter and verse again and again, that the duty of a disciple was to receive his master's teaching, to learn it by heart, and to pass it on. 
and that's called receiving and passing on in exactly the way Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uses the same language of what seems to be a, a creedal assembly of basic Christian teachings. Um, so Riesenfeld and Jair Hartson argued long ago that masters taught their disciples words which they learnt by heart and that's the job of the early witnesses and that's why they're the early teachers and apostles. That's what they do. They learn it by heart and they pass it on. This is not so much a part of our cultural world because of the cheapness of materials for reading, writing and printing. But it was the mark of an educated person in antiquity to know a lot of material by heart. On this sheet I've got a quotation from Josephus about that, saying how many of the Jews learnt their laws by heart from a young age. But one could go to other theorists of education in antiquity, people with long names like Quintilian and so on. But it's the same picture you see on the news when you see a madrasa in Pakistan with the teacher rehearsing Islamic materials and the cross-legged boys on the floor learning them by heart. That was education. Some of us here remember when it was a bit like that in school. Nowadays, nowadays you have to let them explore for themselves. Oh, I'm, I must, I must, there's a, a dangerous hobby horse riding by which I must not leap onto. Um, uh, but you get the feel that, that education in antiquity, in antiquity is about learning by heart and it is about passing on by heart. And if you study the rabbis, you know how carefully they say this goes back to that rabbi who had it from that rabbi who had it from that rabbi who had it from that rabbi. This opinion goes back on this line, possibly not as far to that rabbi. What you did was you learned stuff and you rehearsed it and that was the mark of being a trained rabbi, that was the mark of being an educated person. So we shouldn't be surprised if the Gospels weren't written down in forms we have initially because what people were doing with the Jesus material was that they were remembering it and passing it on in by rote learning. Oh my gosh, I feel I should write a book about a Christian model for education here. But, um, <laughs> To, to press this point, um, a gentleman I know, Rainer Riesner from Germany, wrote a book called Jesus as Teacher, which has never been translated, in which he emphasises that you don't have to just go to the rabbinic schools to prove this. It's not the narrow, highly scholarly circles of Judaism who esteem the value of learning material by heart. It's a much more broad phenomenon even in Jewish education than the, the disciple schools of major teachers. And as I said, it's a, it's a general phenomenon of the ancient world. <coughs> what should we say in addition to this? Um, people have studied oral tradition. There's a reference, I think, on the last page to a man called Jan Van Sina. Has anyone seen Roots? Do you remember Roots? Well, that was about African materials that were being re uh, remembered in the 20th century by people uh, who were the descendants of slaves in the southern US states. Right? And Van Sina was called in to help understand what they'd been remembered and he was actually able to identify the languages from which certain words came. He was a Belgian scholar of the history of Central Africa. But he wrote in the 60s a famous book on the nature of oral tradition and how it works and that was revised in the 80s with a similar title. Um, I wrote it down somewhere on my notes, because you can even find it in Google Books, Jan Van Sina, Oral Tradition as History, 1985. Um, what's going on here? It's a bit of background to this, and you, you, you have to realize nobody does history without an ax to grind. There's, there's no such thing as history which doesn't come from a motivated point of view. I think that's fair although I'm being rather apodectic and German professorial when I say it. Um, what Van Sina wanted to know was what was really the history of Central Africa and, oops, what had the Belgians really done in the Congo? 
Who was that? Amer Joel, Billy Joel, Belgians in the Congo, you know the song, right? Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, right? Bad stuff. And he was extremely careful in his researches uh, because he did not want to accuse the Belgian people of crimes that they genuinely hadn't done based on hearsay of an unreliable character in groups in Africa. He was trying to be very careful. So he did a very extended methodological study of the nature of oral tradition and he discovered that it's reliable as history if a there are people who have the specially designated role of passing it on and b if you use mnemonic devices memory devices to make it easily memorable he knew he was right about that because he compared those things which were recorded in western style written sources about the colonial period with what was still being taught in the villages by the tribal elders as to what had happened in certain situations in the past. And he said if there are people in the tribes with designated roles of passing on the tradition, and if they construct the tradition not as flowing and complex prose, but perhaps in a versified way with interesting rhyme and rhythm which makes it easier to remember, then it's a good record. Now, that's the Jesus tradition, folks. Um, you can tell from the sayings of the Gospels, they're pithy, they're witty, and if you put them back into Aramaic, say, you'll often find rhyme and rhythm and considerable literary sophistication, plays between syllables, plays between similar sounding words. It's very interesting stuff. There was a very learned professor at St Andrews called Matthew Black, who a long time ago wrote a book called an Aramaic approach to the Gospels, in which he lays out all these very interesting things about the things Jesus taught. Not only, of course, are the parables easily memorable. Well, parables are strikingly easy to remember because of their quality, if they come from Jesus. Um, but the other materials contain poetic devices, they contain rhyme, they contain assonance, they contain alliteration, all the things that help you remember stuff. So Jesus, it appears, from Aramaic back translation of the Greek sources was a clever teacher who knew how to compose his material in a memorable way. There were disciples whose job it was to remember it, his inner circle and then the larger circles who were taught by them. We should see that as an important indicator that when we find the Jesus material being written down about about a, gen a generation after Jesus, it's going to have a lot of a a substantial accuracy about it. It's going to work as a source for Jesus, notwithstanding those moments when professors in universities get very upset about an apparent contradiction between the Gospels. Can I end with a story? It's a gruesome story, but your six-year-old may enjoy it. Or your six um, Fred and Joe had a fight in a pub in the East End. In the course of this fight, the Mike Tyson moment happened. A piece got bitten off someone's ear. Right. So the case is going to court and witnesses are called and one witness is absolutely convinced that he knows this happened and he's willing to testify in course that one of them had bitten the other person's ear. But the police officer going by the witness room just before the trial Here's one witness say, I didn't see Fred bite Joe's ear off. Peace of. And the police officer is concerned about this, goes to the judge, goes to the barristers and says, I feel there may be a miscarriage of justice about to happen because the witness who's going to be key in this case is, I've just heard him say the opposite of what he's going to tell you and what is down in his witness statement, you see. So the man, when he gets to the witness stand, is cross-examined rather heavily, and the barrister knows he's got a triumphal moment coming up, and he says, this is about apparent inconsistency in the Gospels. He says, did you actually see Fred bite a piece of Joe's ear off? And Fred says, no. Oh. Then how do you know, Fred? or bit a piece of Joe's ear off. 
because I saw him spit it out. <laughs> um, there will be moments when we just don't know the answer and you should allow that little bit of, is it wriggle room or wiggle room? Some people go wiggle room and some people go wriggle room. You should allow that little piece of room for a few things to go unexplained because perhaps there is an explanation and we just don't know the answer for it, but we might. Testimony, and people who deal with testimony in law courts are very familiar with this kind of phenomenon, that memory can play tricks, it's already subsequent on perception. You perceive what's happened, then you remember what you think you've seen. Um, I was, I was, oh, give, me, give me 30 seconds. I was walking through a park in Canterbury some years ago. There was a bench in the distance, and I saw a kind of curving white shape. It was dark. In the darkness, I could see a sort of, what I thought was perhaps two people huddled on a bench. I could see a shape, and I could see this curving white shape. And I thought, ah, oh, there's a courting couple on the bench. Her arm is raised and her sleeve is twisting in the wind as they kiss. Well, as I got closer, I realised it was a man holding up a plastic bag with a wine bottle in it, about to drink in it, and it was, <laughs> and it was twisting slightly. And, and I was slain. I was, oh, you know, my roommate, oh, gosh. But the point is, if I hadn't seen that, and somebody had asked me, what have you seen? I would say, well, I saw, I think I saw a couple on the bench, and she was wearing white and her sleeve. And, you know, perception is subsequent, uh, we, we interpret, so we interpret, then we remember. And that's one of the reasons why memory can play tricks. People who deal with testimony in law courts deal with that all the time, and maybe that's a factor you should be charitable with on occasions in the Gospels when you see perhaps, I don't, there are these tricky moments in the Gospels. Have you noticed when the foot washing, when, when, no, the anointing scene in John, the oil gets poured on Jesus' feet. In the Matthew and Mark, it's on Jesus' head. Well, you can write a theological essay about the significance of the feet, but perhaps he was just getting a couple of stories confused. And does it matter? Because we kind of know what happened. I've talked too long. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.